Welcome to Hustle and Flow with Heather Hubbard, episode 148. Hi, I'm Heather Hubbard, and I was a litigator partner and practice group leader at an AMLAW 200 firm. I know what it takes to rise to the top. I also know all too well the toll it can take on your personal life. So how do you shine bright without burning out? How do you embrace your ambition without selling your soul? You're listening to the Hustle and Flow podcast. Welcome back. I am your host, Heather Hubbard. I hope you are having a fabulous January, and I cannot wait to share with you our guest for today, Jaquette Timmons. So let me tell you, she may have the most impressive resume of anyone that we have had on the podcast before, but she is, and I love this, a financial behaviorist. She helps people with their money and mostly their choices around their money. So we're going to dig into that more. I love that. She has an MBA in finance from Fordham University. She has a BS in marketing from the Fashion Institute of Technology. You have seen her all over the place. She's been on Good Morning America, CNN, Fox TV's Good Day New York, the New York Daily News, Oprah.com, Daily Worth, Essence Magazine, Forbes, it goes on and on and on. She has a podcast called More Than Money. She's also written a book. She is a guest speaker at many conferences, companies, nonprofit organizations. She has literally done it all. And I am so excited to have her on today. Shaquette, welcome to Hustle and Flow. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so delighted to be here. Yay. Yes. Okay. So I knew I wanted to have you on when you were talking to me about this concept of emotions and money and how it's not just about managing money, but managing our choices around money. And I am all about responsibility because it is empowering. So talk to me about this concept of doing more than just managing money. Yeah. So, you know, the reality is, is that if success with money were simply a math problem, none of us would even need to have the kinds of conversations that we tend to do when it comes to money. Because from a math standpoint, two plus two is going to always equal four. And if there's a calculation that you can't figure out in your head, that's why we have handy dandy calculators and a spreadsheet. But That two plus two equals four formula is not always how things play out in our respective lives. And a visual that I always like to have people think about is just imagine you're in a room and it doesn't even have to be a large room. It can be 10 people. And I walked into that room and I said, hey, let me give everybody a dollar and ask you in 30 days to come back and tell me what did you do with that dollar? Some people would say, I saved some of it or I saved all of it. Others would say, I invested some of it or I invested others of it. Others would say, girl, please, you gave me a dollar. What do you think I did with it? (laughs) (laughs) And then yet there'd even be another set of people that would say, you know what? I didn't do anything with it. I still have it in my wallet or purse or pocket, wherever. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is that any of those choices would be valid because those choices would have been made based upon the circumstances at that moment for the person and the context in which those decisions were made. And if people are thinking, hmm, but you only talked about a dollar, Well, here's where I think it becomes really interesting. What you do with a dollar is precisely what you will do when that dollar now becomes a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars. So you don't automatically become this person that makes different choices around money simply because you have more of it. And so that's what I'm really trying to get people to understand that when it comes to your money and your experience with it and your success with it, it's not just about the numbers. It is about your behavior, your choices and the motivations behind those. Okay, so you work with a lot of professionals. Part of mm-hmm. how we met, right? Was mm-hmm. you, yep. you work with law firms, very yes. successful, wealthy attorneys. Mm-hmm. And I love this concept that what we do when, you know, maybe we're poor and bootstrapping it in law school, that our habits are still going to be similar regardless of how much money we're making. Mm-hmm. So let me ask you this. Do you sometimes work with people that might be millionaires 
but they still have a spending habit problem, right? Like they can't, they struggle with saving. Oh, totally. And I think the challenge in that instance is because you have more of a cushion because you're earning so much more, you tend not to see or you tend not to feel the ramifications of that spending. So someone who doesn't have a lot of money, right? So let's say we're looking at a continuum, we're looking at a spectrum and on the left-hand side are people that don't have a lot of money. If they make a mistake or if they overspend, they're going to feel that a lot faster and perhaps with a lot more intensity density than the person who's at the other end of the spectrum, who is making a whole heck of a lot of money, who doesn't necessarily have to worry about paycheck to paycheck or month to month, because they're not even going to necessarily, quote unquote, feel it or notice it, at least mm-hmm. not in the immediate. So yeah, totally. They can have as, you know, as much of a spending challenge or problem as anybody else. They just don't necessarily feel it in the moment. So let me ask you this, because I think a lot of us are really smart and we might make a lot of money. And then the question becomes, let's say we have bad habits. And my guess is most everyone has at least one or two bad habits around money as that we at least are going to call a bad habit. Right. But I think this probably goes to the emotions and the behavior piece, which is sometimes there's a lot of shame involved in that. And so as opposed to like getting help or getting in front of it, like we just assume that like if we try hard enough, we'll eventually change. Do you see that? So, yes, I do see it. And I think what I want to piggyback on from what you've just shared in terms of the the framework that you just kind of laid out for us. I think part of the challenge, especially what I find when working with lawyers is you work really, really, really hard, right? And so you work hard, you work long hours. And sometimes the very last thing that people want to focus on is their money. And the first thing that you want to focus on when you have some downtime is how can you make yourself feel really good? And so (laughs) I think that combination of working really hard and quote unquote, not having enough time, although I would challenge people on that, but, you know, using what time you do have to feel good has a lot to do with the kinds of choices and the quality of those choices that you make around how you will spend your money and on what. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's talk about that a little bit more. So when we like to feel good, when we take our breaks, right? Mm -hmm. Are we then using that money? I mean, I did this and I know I've talked to others as well. Sometimes we blow money, right? To make us feel better. And sometimes it's like, well, maybe you didn't even need those golden handcuffs in the first place if you better managed, you know, what you were doing with that money and the money you needed to feel better when you weren't working. Is that where you were going or were you thinking of something else? No, I think that that's definitely a piece of it. Absolutely. Is there more? Well, I think, you know, one of the other things that comes into play for some people is, you know, are they also managing the expectation, whether it's self-imposed or it is quote unquote real, if they are the first in their family to go to school, to go to law school, to have an advanced degree, to be earning as much as they are earning, do they have a, a sense of responsibility for their family and their other family members who are not at that same point? And are they having a hard time managing the expectations of those family members? Because what those family members don't understand is, yeah, I am an attorney, right? And I may be making, you know, a quarter of a million dollars, but they're forgetting about the fact that you have law school debt. Or they're forgetting about the fact that you might live, you know, in a part of the country that is extremely expensive. All they see is, oh, they're a lawyer and maybe they're working at an AM 200 firm. They're doing really well. Of course I can ask for this. And sometimes managing that tension is really challenging. So I'm hoping that in that answer, it answers your question. But that's the thought that came to mind for me. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. So now we're going into a different discussion, but I love this because we, at my last retreat for my mastermind, we actually started having this conversation and we also started talking about the cultural differences behind that. Right. So, and sometimes that's racial, sometimes it's, you know, religious, whatever. But for several of us, we were first generation lawyers Mm -hmm. and some of us 
I'll put myself in this category, very much I have zero guilt or feelings of responsibility for anyone else in my family financially. Others had the exact opposite. They very much feel like they can't tell their family no. Uh They're providing not only for themselves, but for their entire families, but such that they can't get ahead, right? (laughs) Yep, exactly. So I'm curious, I mean, do you find that that tends to be cultural or racial or anything like that with regards to who you see showing up as clients? I mean, it is across the board, but I will tell you that if I were to put a couple of people in the room that Mm -hmm. would fall into this category, the majority in terms of the clients that I've worked with or the people that I've had these kinds of conversations with, the majority would either be Black or, you know, of Caribbean descent, African Mm -hmm. descent, Hispanic, Asian, like there would be some ethnic makeup to it. And so do you address that differently? I mean, or I guess I just, I'm curious as to what your philosophy is. Is it about educating or is it about having boundaries both? Or do you have other approaches to that? I think it's about having boundaries. And I respect the fact that, you know, for some people that sense of responsibility is real and strong because some of those family members are in fact, you know, in part those that helped you get to where you are, wherever you are. Right. So I get that. And I, I never, ever dismiss that from my perspective. And I will tell people this transparently in terms of parents, like there's no question you do whatever you need to do to take care of them. But when it comes to siblings and others, like I literally have worked with a client, an attorney. And what we did is we were like, okay, your parents, whatever they need, you take care of that. For your sister and her kids and this person and that person, we're going to put them on a 12 month countdown, but you're going to tell them now that in 12 months, they are not going to get the same sort of whatever they have a need and they come to you, you just automatically take care of it. Mm-hmm. And, and what you're going to do is you're going to come up with an amount and that amount is going to be your family bucket. And you're going to say to them in 12 months, right? <laughs> you got 12 months to get it together. Yeah. <laughs> and then in 12 months, and this is the amount that I'm putting in the family bucket. You can come to me with anything, but once that amount and that bucket is gone, it is gone and it will not be replenished for another year. So I think it's about boundaries and communication of those boundaries. Mm hmm. But this is perfect because it goes to what you were saying about emotions, right? Because this isn't really about managing the dollars and the cents. Mm -hmm. This is about managing something much larger. And I think we sometimes forget that the way that we're managing money, it's really more about emotions and mindset than anything. And it's about identity. It's about, you know, your sense of power, (laughs) your own, the judgment that you are attaching it to your situation, the judgment that you believe other people are attaching to it. And maybe they're being explicit about that judgment. Sometimes Mm -hmm. it's a combination of their explicit judgment, but also what you think people are thinking about you and your particular situation. You guys, great news. The 2020 Planners, Project Pad, and Bookmarks are finally here. More than a typical planner, it is a complete planning system that will revolutionize the way you approach your days, weeks, months, and years. It will help you achieve your biggest goals and work on that to-do list so that you can take back your day and focus on what matters most. Get yours now at lifeinlawplanner.com. Wow, there is so much here that we can unpack. Yeah, well, and it almost takes me back. So when I was even talking about shame, because this now kind of is taking me back there, you know, I think of, and this just isn't lawyers. I mean, I can think of this in many different corporate America or even entrepreneurs, right? Where you have a certain image, you have a certain reputation, you're doing really well, and then something happens. You know, maybe you take a hit or you had a bad investment or whatever it is, Mm -hmm. you're in this financial crisis. And when Mm -hmm. some people take their lives, right, there are instances where it becomes that dire for where they would rather exit out than 
have to deal with presumably like the emotions, right? Of the situation. Mm -hmm. So I just, yeah, sorry. There's not even a question there, but I get where like this is audio, but I feel this in my chest, right? I feel the emotions. I feel the heaviness right now as we're having this conversation of just how much goes into the way we interact with money in a way that we just don't think about too much. But my guess is you do. <laughs> yeah, I do. And and I try to get others to do so as well, even if it means, you know, doing it incrementally, doing it in little doses so that it doesn't feel overwhelming because it is the layered piece of money that can either smooth your journey or make it extremely, extremely challenging. Because there's one thing that I always remind people of, and and I guess there are a few elements to it. And one of the pieces is that we all have a relationship with money, whether we want to recognize it or not, we all have a relationship with it. And it is one of the longest relationships that we will have. It will be longer than any romantic relationship of yours, depending Mm -hmm. upon your birth order, if you have siblings. It will be longer than that. And the only thing that it really competes with is your parents or whomever may have raised you from an infant. And so this idea of recognizing that it is with you for the entirety of your life. It's like if you think of a road trip, it is literally with you every single mile of that road trip. It does not go away. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so for something that's never going to go away, for something that's constantly hovering and silently impacting, you know, how you just live in the world, I think it is, it is critically important to respect that relationship and not only respect that relationship, but also recognize that you've got a voice and a part of your voice is in you taking charge and giving your money direction, even in those moments where you don't feel like you have much control because we've all been there too, if we're being honest, (laughs) of course. (laughs) but you still in that moment, get to make a choice, even if it's not your ideal choice, you get to make a choice. And I think it is important to recognize that and to, to embrace it instead of trying to resist it. I 100% agree with you. Anyone that listens to the show knows that I, I am a huge proponent of like, we always have a choice, right? There are some things we can't control, but a lot of things we can. And if we Mm -hmm. don't take responsibility for our decisions or we claim that we don't have, you know, the power to make a decision, it's disempowering. It's really important to own our choices. And by the way, if you say, well, I'm not making a choice, you are. You are making a choice, even if you're not right. allegedly making a choice. Because it gives you power, right? Even when you're in those situations that aren't ideal, it mm-hmm. allows you to climb out of it the way you want to. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I'll just reinforce what you just shared by just reminding people that you always have a choice, even if you don't like the options that are available Mm. to you to make. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about something fun. Okay. Let's say we've got, right. It's like, okay, I'm not in it. Like I've got pretty good financial habits, but I've got more money than I know what to do with. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. Right. Because presumably it's not just about behavior when it's like, oh, I don't have money. It's like, well, but what about when you do? Like I said, my guess is that you work with clients that have money to spend in different ways. And it's about being intentional and not just from this like safety and security, but also having fun and and having, you know, experiences in your life. Tell me about that side of your business. Yeah. And so the idea is, you know, make sure that people are tapping into both. Like, so even if you're feeling a little tight, that you tap into the abundant part. And when you're feeling abundant, I think what is really critically important is that you do indeed to just steal your words for a moment, you do indeed become more intentional. The key is to be intentional and to give your money direction. And that's required whether you are, you know, struggling a little bit. And it's also required when you've got everything, right? You've got, you're earning your high, whatever that number is, and you're completely debt free. Like, for example, I think we talked about this when we had an offline conversation. You know, I recently did a retreat for one of my law firm clients. And one of the people, one of the partners came up to me and said, you know, Clearly, I'm in a different place than some of the associates and I don't have any debt. You know, college is completely paid for all my kids, no mortgage, like nothing. She's like, but what you said reminded me to think about my legacy and what am I leaving behind? And, you know, how am I 
you know, being an example and being more intentional and explicit in terms of teaching my own kids about money and how am I thinking about my own philanthropy. And so I think the thing to keep in mind is that with every level of success that one has, it requires a new set, perhaps a new set of financial responsibilities. It might mean a shift in your financial role, and it might mean needing to rethink, well, what does financial success mean? And how do I step into this new level of financial success? To me, it's never just, you know, you reach a tranche, if you will, and then it just stops. Well, no, you reach that tranche and then you go to another level, but the practices that got you to one level, they may not sustain you for very long as you're moving up to the next level. You know, and this kind of goes back to the conversation around being first generation lawyers or, you know, regardless of of your profession, right? Like if you did not grow up with money, you may not know much about it, right? Like you may not have received a ton of education about it. And so you get to a certain point and it's like, well, now what? And what's available to you and how are you going to use it in different ways? So I love that concept of not just what's the legacy, but what do you want to do, right? Like if you're earning all of this money, because a lot of us do chase that, right? Like we see it as a success marker for what, right? Is it just, you know, what is it in service to? Exactly. And I would also caution people not to think that even if someone, you know, grew up in a family that had more means, significantly more means than you, don't automatically assume that they know how to manage their money any better than you do. And and I say that, you know, prior to having my own firm, I worked at an investment bank. I was in the private bank. I managed money for high net worth individuals. And so I got a chance to see up close and personal that yes, they do indeed (laughs) have a couple of more commas and zeros behind those commas. And certainly my family did, but that doesn't mean that every single, you know, younger family member also knew how to manage money. Sometimes because of their family situation, maybe they have a family office, some of the responsibilities that you and I may take for granted or the knowledge that you and I may take for granted, they've never had to put into practice because it's never been a situation where they've had to make certain kinds of decisions. So I think we need to get beyond that. Yeah, yeah. And I, I want people to get beyond this idea that, if I grew up in, you know, a particular way and perhaps it was less than somebody else's, that that somebody else knows more than me. They may or may not. They may. And if they do, ask some questions and find out what you can learn. But don't make that assumption that they automatically do because it may not be accurate. This goes back to the, right, the concept of, again, emotions and all of that stuff, because we just pack so much into money. And a lot of times we don't talk about it. So the fact that you were bringing that up and said, ask, makes me think of, what do you call it? The comfort circle dinners that uh-huh. you do? Mm-hmm. Yes. All right. Yes. So, you know, tell us about those, because we were talking about this before. I love this concept. And for those who are actually you know, in your area, it would be really cool if they could even attend. But I do think it gives us an idea that we all need to be talking about this more in general. Yeah. And you know, one of the reasons for the dinners, I want to dispel this myth. So let me just back up. There's a myth that says we don't talk about money. And I actually think that that myth is incorrect in that I think we talk about money all the time. I just don't think we're having the right substantive conversations. Mm -hmm. And so the dinner is my anecdote to that or antidote to that. And ironically enough, (laughs) the idea for the dinner was sparked by a client who was a lawyer, general counsel for a publicly traded company. And she and I were working together. I'm, you know, working as her financial coach. And she had a particular issue that was outside of my scope of expertise. But I know a lot of people. I referred her to someone and it all worked out. Well, when we had our follow-up session, she was like, oh my God, I'm so glad that you referred me to ABC because I don't know what I would have done. I think I may have just gone to the yellow pages. And in my mind, I'm thinking, really? Given your profile, that would have been your option. Of course, I was much more diplomatic and delicate in my (laughs) response, but that was what was going on in my head, like a little bubble thought cloud. 
And what she said to me was not something, it wasn't the first time that I heard it, but it just landed with me very differently. And she was like, you know, I can talk to my friends about sex. I cannot talk to them about money. Mm. And there are a whole host of reasons why I think some close friendships have that dynamic. And so my thought was, well, how can I create a space where people feel like their pedigree, their education, what they do professionally does not negate the fact that they are not necessarily good with money and that they have some questions and they want to feel comfortable asking their questions and they want to feel comfortable admitting what it is that they don't know and admitting where it is that they still need to improve upon. What can I do to create a safe space for people to be vulnerable with their money. And that's where the dinners come into play. And it's purposefully designed to be small so that that intimacy can indeed be fostered. And each month we have a different topic or theme to kind of reflect the fact that money impacts us personally and our careers and our businesses in a variety of different ways. And so let's talk about all of those different ways, you know, each dinner season, if you will. Oh my gosh. So guys, this is in New York, New York City. So if yes. that's where you're located, then just sign up already. And, you know, I'm sitting here thinking I, I need to fit it in with a trip up there sometimes. So that would be lovely. Oh my gosh, I would love that. <laughs> but you do retreats, you do corporate speaking, you are a coach. How can, if people are interested in learning more about you, what's the best way for them to do that? I think one of the best things to do is to actually go to my site, jacquettetimmons.com, and to actually do the financial wheel exercise, which you can access for free. And it's both an exercise and a brief, you know, four-part e-course. But what it is designed to do is to help you either get reconnected or maybe even perhaps for the very first time, create your financial vision so that you can get a sense of what are the behavioral changes that you might need to make, the changes that you might need to make in terms of your choices so that you can close the gap between where you are and where it is that you want to be. And that's free. And again, you could just go to the site or you can follow me on social media. And I'm really active on Instagram and Twitter. So just put my name in the search box and my respective handles will come up. I love it. I'm always amazed when like 30 minute passes because I feel like we just got started. Um, I know. Thank you so much for coming on. This was absolutely wonderful. I really enjoyed starting some of these conversations that I feel like we need to finish. We need to keep going. So maybe I'm going to have to come up for a dinner. Okay. Oh God, so, so before we go, before we yeah. wrap, can I just piggyback on something? And it is your word start. Absolutely. Because the other thing that I want people to recognize is that it is indeed an ongoing conversation. So whether you're having a, you know, a conversation with yourself, whether you're having a conversation with a significant other, a family member, or even a boss, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's yep. never a one and done kind of situation. So I thank you for saying that. That and, and having that be the tripwire for me to remember to remind people that it's never just a single conversation. It's the beginning of many to follow. Because again, remember, it's a relationship that is ongoing and everlasting. <sighs> Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Well, this is the beginning of many conversations, at least between you and I. <laughs> yes, <possible>. exactly. <laughs> thank you so much for coming oh, on thank the show. you. It has thank been a delight. You. Everyone go check out jacquettetimmons.com and we will have that link in the show notes as well. Have a great day, a great week, and we will see you on the next episode. Thank you. For show notes, downloads, and other free resources, and to keep the conversation going, head on over to hustleandflowpodcast.com. See you there.